Prospect Team of the Week. Is Christian Encarnacion Strand ready to join Ellie De La Cruz in Cincinnati? Let's talk about it. You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on in to Locked on MLB Prospects, your home for all things minor league baseball. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby, freelance baseball writer and podcaster. Thank you for making this your first listen every single day. We're probably part of the Locked on Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. And today's episode is made possible by our friends at Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked on MLB for $20 off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. So looking at the prospect team of the week, uh, what guys did last week in the minors, we're going to start with the infield because with the success that Cincinnati has seen from L.A. De La Cruz, calling up number one prospect in baseball and how he's been such a revelation for them, the logical question, and a lot of Reds fans are already there, is Christian Encarnacion Strand. He's your projected first baseman. And he is on fire right now. Five games last week, they gave him a day off. So this is not, uh, it was not like a, he was injured. It was just, they gave him a day of rest. Five games in the minors, and I broke the rules on the prospect team of the week because he played third three days and first only two. But it's my show and I can do that. Christian Encarnacion Strand in AAA Louisville over five games, 10 and 19, Three home runs, two doubles, nine runs, eight RBIs, six walks to three strikeouts, and no stolen base attempts. Is he ready for the big leagues? Is the question. And it kind like there's the surface numbers tell you yes, and then there's reasons to think that maybe he's not. So on the season, 42 games in Louisville. 362, 427, 734, 17 home runs, 31 extra base hits, 19 walks to 44 strikeouts in 42 games. So it's right around once a game, no stolen base attempts, but there's always a, but there was a really, really good article on Monday from JJ Cooper at baseball America talking about CES. We're just going to, it's so much easier to say CES about how he has swung at 41% of pitches outside the strike zone this year. Uh, And at the MLB level, they talk about, like, outside the zone, they talk about the chase zone and the waste zone. Like, pitches more than one ball with out of the strike zone. And how guys, like, in the majors, guys who swing at chase and and waste zone pitches are batting 092 with a 461 on base. Like that's the way that you get a high on base percentages. You don't swing at those bad balls. But Christian Encarnacion Strand is batting 271 with a 475 slugging on those same pitches. And so the position that JJ Cooper is taking in the piece is that statistically, this is not sustainable. This is not a sustainable approach at the MLB level. And he goes on and he explains, no MLB hitter with 200 or more plate attempts that uh, uh, that finished on a chase or a waste pitch. So the pitch you actually either strike out on or get the hit on, put the ball in play on, nobody with 200 or more plate attempts in those situations had hit better than 240 or slugged better than 293 over their career. The best hitter in MLB at that is Luis Arise, who is batting over 400 in MLB competition, but in those situations, bats 240. And only two players have more than 13 career home runs against chase and waste pitches. And he clarifies that we don't have the stats for Vlad Guerrero Jr. Or sorry, Vlad Guerrero Sr. That's too far out. But the last 16 years, only two guys have had more than 13 career home runs in those cases. Pablo Sandoval had 21. Miguel Cabrera had 26. So I'm torn. CES needs to have the change in approach 
that we saw Ellie De La Cruz have this year when he started striking out less and walking more in AAA to get called up. I still feel like CES needs to do that before you call him up. But at the same time, I could understand if Cincinnati just went ahead and said, you know what? Let's just let's just do it and let's see how it works. Either way, fantastic performance last week. Definitely a deserving member of the prospect team of the week. You look at some of the other performances. Catcher Brandon Valenzuela of the San Diego Padres was in high A, so Fort Wayne. Three games at catcher, two games at DH. 9 of 20, a home run and three doubles. Seven runs, which is a lot for a catcher. One RBI, three walks to four strikeouts. Defensively, he's very, very good. The question was, would he hit enough to be a starting uh, catcher in MLB? And the projection has been he doesn't have the power and he doesn't quite have the bat. He's going to be a backup catcher. If he can continue having weeks like that, he can play himself into a starting role. But obviously, San Diego has, I mean, Luis Campusano, uh, Ethan Salas, who's in low A. There's tons of great catchers in this organization. So he's got work to do to get his offense to the level of getting into games. The second baseman on this team is a guy who's had a little bit of MLB time already in Jonathan Aranda of the Tampa Bay Rays. Six games all at second base for Durham last week. 15 to 27, five doubles, six runs, six RBIs, four walks to six strikeouts, 0 for 1 on stolen bases. That is the like the ideal. Jonathan Aranda, like that is the, the the stereotypical Jonathan Aranda stat line. Batted over 500, no home runs, got stole, like got thrown out trying to steal a base. Uh, the thing with Jonathan Aranda, and they called him up last year and then sent him back down. Power is at best average. His defense is below average. His speed is pretty low, like probably a 30 grade or so. He is speaking of Luis Arise. He is very much like Luis Arise. And, I mean, right now, he's diet Luis Arise. But a situation where you've got so many options in Tampa Bay because you have, like, his defense isn't good anywhere. They've tried him in the outfield. They've tried him at first, at second, at third. They've tried him at left. None of it really worked out. You've got guys who can play defense at those positions, like a Kyle Manzardo, who's going to have more power right behind him. And in the meantime, you've got Yandy Diaz. You've got all these other guys. Jonathan Aranda doesn't feel like he's going to get a starting spot in Tampa without some sort of trade to a new organization or somebody in front of him like Brandon Lowe getting moved to get him a chance to be in the lineup, kind of like how Luis Arise got traded to Miami, although he was a starter in Minnesota. Third uh, shortstop on this team, Jordan Lawler of the Arizona Diamondbacks, one of the top shortstop prospects in baseball. Six games in double A, 11 to 27, a home run and three doubles and a triple. 11 runs, two RBIs, one walk to two strikeouts, two for two on stolen bases. Fantastic performance from Jordan Lawler, just more of the same that we've seen. The time frame I don't think has changed. He got 20 games in double A last year. You're at 48 or so right now. I'm thinking late in, like a little bit later, a month or two, you can bump him to AAA, end of the year call up, and he can try a rookie of the year campaign in 2024. But you still have guys at the major league level who can play short, so it's not like you're in a hurry to do it. Runner up here, by the way, Marco Luciano, the Giants, five games in double A, seven to 23 home runs and a double, four runs to nine RBIs, five walks to three strikeouts, also stole two bases. The third baseman on this team, and honorable mention real quick to Colt Keith. He's usually either on this team or an honorable mention. He is an honorable mention this week. But the third baseman went to Michael Bush of the Los Angeles Dodgers. And that's an interesting development because he played all six games at third base in the minors. He got up earlier in the year to LA and moved around, played second, played third, kind of was a, I'm going to call him as a baby Muncie. Just kind of, he, he did the same role as Max Muncy, playing second, playing third, DHing. Uh, defense is probably a little bit below average, but he's a power hitter with a lower batting average. That's, uh, that's Michael Bush. But all three games at third, still not convinced the arm strength's enough to be above average at third, but either way, six games at third, 13 to 26, three home runs, four doubles, and a triple. So eight of his 13 hits were for extra bases. Seven runs to 11 RBIs, 
Three walks to six strikeouts, no stolen base attempts. I, he is he is their next version of Max Muncy. You've got guys at the major league level. Miguel Vargas is, can play second, can play third. It's that that's what uh, that's what Michael Bush is going to be. And in the, in the meantime, you've got once you're done with JD Martinez, you may see a guy like Muncy move into a a DH role to make room for Michael Bush at the bigs and him having versatility to play both second and third really does help him find a starting job. In just a minute, I've got the outfield of this team, including a couple guys that we've talked about before and one that was just called up. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Game Time. Buying tickets to your favorite event should not be stressful, no matter if it's a sporting event, a concert, a comedy show, the theater, whatever it might be. And that's why the Game Time app is the fastest growing ticketing app in the country. They have last minute ticket deals on all kinds of events and the best price guarantee. The Game Time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. So buy your tickets with comfort because if it turns out there was a better deal, you will get the money back plus some. So don't even worry about it. Just snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use promo code Locked on MLB for $20 off your first purchase. Again, create an account, use promo code Locked on MLB for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. In the outfield of the prospect team in the week, we've got a couple, uh, not usual suspects, but a couple guys we've talked about on this team before. Yankeel Fernandez of the Colorado Rockies made the team six games in high A. Four of them, he started the right. Two games, he was the DH. 11 of 28, three home runs, three doubles, and a triple. Eight runs, 13 RBIs, three walks to six strikeouts, one for one on stolen bases. A a guy we've talked about before, big arm, big power. There's been questions about his his contact ability. There's been questions about his defense. There's been questions about his speed. So he's like, we're going to stick him in a corner. Again, he's got a big arm. He can hit big bombs, but he's got to be able to give us some of the other stuff. I, I've seen it called a power over everything profile. So in high A Spokane, and we talked about him recently, but just a quick refresher on the stats, 54 games in high A, 330, 365, 626, 16 home runs, 33 extra base hits, 13 walks to 44 strikeouts, one for two on stolen bases. We're... We're not quite at the point where he needs to get moved to double A for the greater challenge, but we're closer. He's not walking a ton, 13 walks in 54 games, but the batting average is plenty high. And so I do want to see what can happen when he faces better stuff, as well as uh, where he has to work for his walks. He's Again, he's not doing it much because he's incentivized to swing at anything close to the zone to have something to hit. Uh, I want to see where guys can have better command and control, can land their stuff for strikes, and then can take it out of the zone. Can he cha- like? Can he resist chasing it or not? So, uh, Yankwil Fernandez in high A probably should go to double A. Uh, Luis Mato, San Francisco Giants, triple A. We talked about him a week or two ago. Six games for them. 11 to 28 hit five home runs with a double. So six of his 11 balls are for extra bases. Scored seven runs, had nine RBIs, two walks to two strikeouts, two for two on stolen bases. On the season in Sacramento, and remember, he started in double A. So so he finishes 22 in high A Eugene. The last 90 games, he's in high A Eugene. Gets to Double A Richmond. He's there for just over a month. Uh, like the start this year, Double A Richmond. It's like 304, 398, 443. And they said, okay, we're, we're going to get you to a higher level to see if we can get you to the bigs. So in Sacramento, it's just under a month, like 24 games. 396, 434, 660. Six home runs, 14 extra base hits, seven walks to eight strikeouts, 
six of seven on stolen bases. Really impressed with how little he's striking out and very impressed with now that he's healthy, how good the contact ability has been. I feel like we were giving him, we were marking him. A lot of people in the prospect apparatus had him as a 40 or a 45 for the hit tool. He's probably at least average. And I think power wise, he's probably gone from a 50 or to or a 55 to maybe plus power. Now, speed, I still think the speed is average. I think the defense is fine. He could be a center fielder. I think he's better in a corner. And the Giants do have a lot of options for both center field and the corners. So it all depends on, one, do they sell at the deadline? And if they do, who do they move? But if you send a guy like a Michael Conforto out because he has an opt-out in the deal, I could see uh, Matos getting called up and getting some time at the end of the season preserve rookie eligibility, and then make a run in 2024 for Rookie of the Year. The third guy, the one of these three I think we've talked about the least, Judd Fabian of the Baltimore Orioles. Because if there's one thing the Orioles need, it's an outfielder pro- It's an outfielder prospect that we got to talk about. Like, they just don't have enough of those. But was, dra- was drafted twice, drafted last year by the, the Red Sox in the second round, despite word and everything getting out that there was already a deal in place with the Orioles, like a pick after them. They took him, couldn't meet his salary demands. He goes back to college. His little brother who had made the team. They played together, got drafted by the Orioles this year, got like slot value. Like just here's your slot value. Let's go. 50 games in high A Aberdeen this year. 297, 401, 517. It's just inches away from the 345 slash line, the magical slash line we talk about. Nine home runs, 11, uh, 20 extra base hits. He had 11 doubles, so 20 extra base hits. 32 walks to 51 strikeouts in 50 games. 18 to 23 on stolen bases. So he is striking out about once a game, which is, that's kind of about the most that we're comfortable with. And it really feels like he's coming up very soon on moving from high A to double A buoy. When you look at the week he had, six games, he went 11 for 19, three home runs, three doubles, scored eight runs, uh, hit 11 RBIs, four walks to five strikeouts, and stole two bases. Uh, three games in center, three games in left. He's a flexible guy. This The arm is average. Speed is plus, defense is plus, but the arm is average. So if you're not going to have him playing center, you're going to put him in left because you're going to have somebody with a better arm in right. It's good enough to play in right. Don't get me wrong, but it's not an asset out there. It's just there, and you're going to have you're always going to have somebody with a better arm who can play right field. The thing that we saw last year was, and he got like a li- he spent most of the time after being drafted at Del Mar, but a little bit of time at Aberdeen. But some of the story was. He really had to figure out, one, he had some swing and miss in his game, and that's just kind of, I mean, it's there. He's a he's a power hitter despite being a center fielder. Like, that's going to happen. But he got better with elevated fastballs. You know, he came from the SEC, so he dealt with good velocity, but it was the combination of good velocity with that backspin, that carry up in the zone that he seemingly struggled with. So he got better at that. And now what he's working on, and I've seen improvements over the course of this year. I've watched him probably a half dozen times now, uh, which isn't a ton, I know, but we're doing the best we can with 120 teams to cover here. Uh, He's he's working on spin from a righty. That's the big thing that he's trying to get better at uh, so that he can keep moving up. But he's a really unique profile as a power hitting center fielder. Again, plus speed, plus defense. I think the power is plus as well. And with some of the improvements he's made to the hit tool, dealing with the fastballs, getting better at uh, breaking pitches from a righty specifically, it really feels like he's probably going to get upgraded the next time you see the rating re-rates to at least an average hit tool, if not better. I think Baseball America had him in the mid-teens on their prospect rankings for the Orioles. I would expect him to jump up into probably the top 10. Although, granted, this system does have a lot of guys, uh, a lot of quality guys above him because they have a lot of guys that are kind of starting to get stuck at AAA, like a 
Joey Ortiz and a Jordan Westberg and things like that because they've got so many really good prospects in both the infield and the outfield. I mean, Keir Stodd, Colton Kowser's back from injury, a lot of guys in the outfield as well. So starting to kind of get a glutton here, but the Orioles feel like a good t- candidate to either make a trade off the major league roster or the prospect depth uh, to supplement at the deadline. And Judd Fabian could either be a guy that gets moved or he could be the beneficiary when somebody above him that's blocking him gets moved. In just a minute, let's talk about the pitchers on this team because there's a couple really interesting guys, uh, including a Yankees prospect we're not talking a bunch about. And we'll get to that next right here on Locked on MLB Prospects. Welcome back to the show. We are going through our prospect team of the week. The left-handed pitcher on this team, because I just, that's what I do. I always do left-handed pitchers. First, we're looking at Michael Prosecchi of the Colorado Rockies. He's pitching in low A Fresno. He was a sixth rounder last year out of University of Louisville. And I believe they tried to draft him. They were connected to him a little bit in like when he was in high school, despite being an, like he was out of, I think, Illinois or somewhat. And there were some connections there, but they draft him after college and uh, had, a, had a good start last week. Six innings, two hits, no runs, two walks with 11 strikeouts. Fastball sits uh, low 90s, so you give a little bit of grace with a lefty on the velocity uh, because he's a lefty, but it's still just kind of average. He's got a changeup to go along with it. Uh, it's it's something where, better than the sum of all parts, he's not a rated prospect in the system. It feels like the potential is there if he can polish the stuff, but... Anybody who's kind of, you know, change-up reliant sometimes ends up being a little bit, the ceiling's a little bit limited sometimes because of the the issues you can have with the change-up and the overall ceiling of a change-up versus other pitches. But Michael Prosecchi, Prospect Team of the Week, runner-up, uh, or honorable mention, I guess, Jackson Wool for the San Diego Padres. Six innings, two hits, no runs, no walks, seven strikeouts. Was really kind of impressed by that. I uh, thought it was really interesting. So, right-hand pitcher for this team, Connor Phillips of the Cincinnati Reds. Got a game in double A. Seven innings, one hit, no runs, one walk, 10 strikeouts. He was the player to be named later in the Jesse Winker deal. So, not a bad addition to a for a player to be named later. Uh, th- you know, and... and 2022nd rounder out of junior college and somebody that like fastball slider very very good I like the curveball as well when you watch what Connor Phillips does and you saw this if you go back and you watch this outing in double a you see what he does fastball uh, one of those flat angle up in the zone fastballs a lot of backspin to it sits 95 to 97 he can carry that velocity pretty well through the outing and then he can just reach back and grab a little bit extra when he needs it now and again. It's 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 pretty impressive how well he can carry that through. The slider, it's in the mid-80s. I'd call it a plus pitch. Fastball is probably a 70 grade. Slider's a plus pitch. Sits in the mid-80s. Has really good two-plane break to it. So if you are a right-handed hitter, it is diving down and away from you. Uh, and the important thing is it tunnels very well with the curveball and the fastball, despite the curveball having a different pattern for the break. The curveball is a vertical breaking curveball. It's almost exactly 12 to 6. The camera angles are sometimes a little bit funky with that Chattanooga team, but it looks like it's a a straight downward breaking uh, curveball. Sits in the high 70s. And so everything really kind of just looks exactly the same halfway to the plate. And then all of a sudden the curveball buries into the dirt the slider darts away from you and the fastball looks like it comes over your bat and just stays up in the zone. On the season, 11 starts, and he went back to Chattanooga. He was there some last year. He had some some issues with walks. He walked 34 guys in 45 innings. It wasn't mechanical. It was not being aggressive enough uh, in hitters counts and in those 3-2 counts, things like that, and walking guys trying to get him to chase. He was a little more confident, a little more velocity, a little more confident in attacking guys this year. So, 1-2, 3-6-3 ERA in those 11 starts. 
Uh, 89 strikeouts in 52 innings, so 15.4 per nine to 23 walks, 3.9 per nine. So he lowered, he almost cut the walks in half and he took the strikeouts from 11.8 per nine to 15.4 per nine. He's given up eight home runs. That's kind of part of the whole thing. But Connor Phillips looks like another guy who, yes, we need to check what the double A baseballs are doing. But when you watch the vertical break or the, the, the induced vertical break on the fastball doesn't seem that much different from last year. So I think it's just natural growth. And in that case, let's I want to see him soon get to AAA to Louisville so he can test this out. But it looks like yet another pitching addition that the Reds can make. Just like you had Hunter Green and Nick Lodolo, and you called up Andrew Abbott. Now if you have Connor Phillips, you're like you're starting to get just a line of competitive pitchers. Combine that with the position players. You've already called up Elodie LaCruz, obviously Spencer Steer. We talked about CES to open the show. And all of a sudden, it's really easy to kind of imagine the Reds being a team that could contend for the Central this year. It's it's surprising how easily that could happen. So picture it. Reds fans, be excited about it. This is a great time to be... Uh, this is a great time, believe it or not, to be a Reds fan because these guys are all super exciting to watch. Uh, some runners up here. Really interesting, guys. Clayton Beater, the New York Yankee, started two games last week. I believe it was in double A. 11 innings, six hits, no runs in the two outings. Four walks to 17 strikeouts. Uh, they are definitely missing pitching prospects in that Yankee system. It's like Will Ward and Clayton Beater, and a, like that's you shipped a lot of arms out last year at your deadline deal. So you need these guys to develop. He's in Double A Somerset, has an ERA under two and a quarter after like eleven starts. So you feel good about it. He was there for a while last year. It's probably time to move him from from Double A Somerset to Triple A Scranton Wilkes Bar to see what he can do. Uh, go along with that. Alan Winnens of the Atlanta Braves, AAA and Gwinnett, organizational guy, but had a complete game. Nine innings, four hits, one run, two walks, three strikeouts. Wanted to give him some love. Guys like him don't get a ton of love. It's always an achievement when a dude can go nine innings. I don't care. Uh, like I don't. It's professional baseball. You throw nine innings, you deserve to be an honorable mention in the prospect team of the week. Uh, Tommy Mace of the Cleveland Guardians. Another Cleveland Guardians pitching prospect. He's in high A. He went eight innings and one start last week. Two hits, no runs, no walks, 11 strikeouts. It's amazing to me that Cleveland is just this consistently good at finding pitchers. And we've talked about this before. He was a second round supplemental in 21 out of the University of Florida. Because since uh, Cleveland has noticed Florida can't seem to develop their pitchers correctly. And so they go and they get these guys at better deals than they could have gotten them if they had been somewhere else and had been improved and developed. And then they're able to make them into better pitchers. His fastball is faster. He's he's touching like 98 now, you know, averaging 94, 95. They added to that. He's got a cutter, a curveball, a changeup. They've tightened up the curveball a little bit. It looks like a more like a better piece. And so the pitching development in Cleveland remains strong. And if you move a guy like Shane Bieber at the deadline, you're going to have to keep the pipeline of pitching prospects on their way to Cleveland. So good job there. Great rest of the week coming up. Reminder, if you have questions for the mailbag, I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. Show's on Twitter at Locked on Farm. You can email us, prospects at gmail.com or drop your questions in the Locked on MLB Prospects Discord. Links in the episode description. Links in the show notes. Until tomorrow's show, remember, it's always a great time to pay a minor leaguer. <laughs>